Good afternoon. My name is Shobna Murati, Editor-in-Chief for Voice of Asia, Newsweekly in Houston, Texas. Today we are here, Sunday, April the 12th, to interview Mr. and Mrs. Medley. He also uh, goes by the name Sarvabhauma Das, that is his ordained name, and she's Dr. Hansa Medley. Peter and Hansa Medley, good afternoon to you. Thank this you. this interview is being conducted for Foundation for India Studies and Indo-American Oral History Project. Let us begin to understand what they're here for. We're here to understand when you came to Houston and how you felt the city and how you were feeling as an immigrant when you first came to Houston. How old were you and what was the situation like? Okay, I was 27 years old, and I was um, invited here by my spiritual teacher, His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami. Uh, he was a leader uh, in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, known as ISKCON, or the Hare Krishna Temple. Mm -hmm. And the temple had just moved from Rosalie Street to the current location on 34th, and a half, on 34th Street. And they were installing the new Radha Krishna deities, the life-size Radha Nila Madhava as we know them, and he invited me to come for the installation. So on his invitation, I came. So you are in, you're into Krishna consciousness as a, as a child. Is, is it back home in India also you were a Krishna conscious person? Well, my tradition is that I was born of Gujarati families, our parents, uh, but I was born in Fiji, a small Pacific island. And um, of course, we were Hindus by birth, but I did not understand much about Hinduism till I came in touch with uh, Swami Prabhupada's books. He is the founder of the ISKCON Society. And then when I read his books, then I was convinced that this is the tradition I want to follow. So when you came to Houston, Dr. Medley, what was the Hindu families like? Were there any temples? How, how was the whole, uh, the Hindu culture here, did it pick up? Or can you give us a little insight on that? Yeah, when I first came here, like we said, we had moved from the Rosalie Street Temple. It was a little shoebox in downtown, and they had just acquired this, this property. And at that time, the temple was a small church building. It used to be a Baptist church. And surrounding that, there were maybe seven or eight devotee homes where the devotees used to stay. They were in like trailer homes, or they were in apartment buildings. And uh, of course at that time, and even today, most of the Hindu population was in Southwest Houston. And uh, so one of the um, comments that we received was, why are you building a temple so far away from where most of the Hindus are? The, uh, the um, vision of our spiritual teacher was that this particular part of town, just outside uh, downtown, is more central and more easily located. And his uh, vision was that we should promote this Hinduism or our Vedic culture and philosophy, not on, why only amongst the Hindus? There's this large local population who also needs to know us and understand us, and we can contribute to this society. And the result has been, since we have moved there, the property values in that area have gone up. There are now at least six, at least 10 or 12 new homes constructed, and many Indian families now have moved close to the temple. And of course, we have started a day school, a preschool, which is going to expand further, and also acquire property around the temple for apartment buildings, and also the temple is going to start a restaurant. So starting with a small shoebox where we're promoting this culture, we have grown quite a bit. And you're, by, you're a doctor by profession, you're a phys physician. Can you tell us your um, expertise, which, what is the speciality you're in? Yes, I am an internal medicine physician, and um, my back, well, I'm originally from Fiji, but I got my medical degree in um, Gwalia, in India. Okay. I was, uh, at that time in Fiji, we did not have a medical school, so the Indian government had a reciprocal arrangement with the Fijian government, and they would award certain uh, seats to F Fiji students. So I uh, was a student on that scholarship, so I was in Gwalia, India. And after I finished medical school, I went back to Fiji and practiced for some time before I came here. So how many of you came here? How, how many siblings and uh, okay. what are the families that came here? 
Okay, so um, before I came, my spiritual master had um, actually invited my sister to come here. He had arranged the marriage of my sister with a local um, American devotee. devotee. So she, they had moved to Dallas, and then when he was um, developing this center here in Houston, he wanted uh, some devotees with, who would be very familiar or comfortable with the Indian American culture to come. So my sister was married to an American, she moved here. And then a few other local Americans uh, moved. And then together they started to um, speak about this message amongst the local Indians. And then he was very instrumental in bringing local um, like Indians to come on board on the management in ISKCON. Traditionally, the, when Srila Prabhupada first established the ISKCON society, the people who first joined were Americans. Mm -hmm. But, and it was more like a revolutionary type of, or alternative type of religion. Mm -hmm. But as it grew and matured, then the Hindus, the tradition, the Indians who considered themselves Hindus, began to recognize the authenticity of this movement. And they also started to join. And then they took up many uh, positions, not only as a spiritual practice, but also in terms of managing. So my spiritual teacher um, was very uh, forward-thinking in that sense. He brought on these Indians as initially as advisors and consultants. And by serving, and, uh, serving Krishna, a lot of them took up the process very seriously and became devotees. So were you given a position in the ISKCON thing, or is it your parents were doing involved in the bo on the board? No, uh, we, my parents were Hindu, and so we were raised in a tradition, like a Hindu family. But religion, to me, was something that I wasn't really convinced that it was something um, authentic. I, my parents placed a premium on education. They both did not have much education, but they were very, um, um, what should I say, they were very driven, to, driven mm -hmm. to get education for their children and also for their siblings. Right. So um, they wanted that their children should be educated. And, and, and I used to think that if you, if you don't teach about God in, in school, it must not be important. Okay. And, and, but then later on, when I studied Prabhupada's books, I realized that actually this, is, this culture and this philosophy is something which is very important. And somehow or other, I, we hadn't been in touch with that. So. I think that brings us to the question, how you met Sarvabhamadas, and I would like to hear from you, sir, how, how you met your lovely wife. Well, she came to Houston, uh, I believe, she came for that deity, for that temple installation, of installation yes. and then she stayed kind of a sabbatical for a year, and she had worked for some time in a hospital in Fiji, and she was uh, wanting just to experience maybe some time just serving in the temple, mm -hmm. as, as her sister was doing. Right. So I saw that she was, I was in the temple also. You were already a devotee then? I was a full-time devotee living in the temple property. And I saw that she was a good devotee and basically the temple president at some point said, have you thought of getting married at some time? So it was kind of an arranged marriage. Okay. And we... And how long have you all been married? Um, we got married in 1987, and um, it was, well, like he said, it was arranged by our spiritual teacher. Mm -hmm. And we have made, because it was arranged in that way, and we got the blessings of our spiritual master. So even though there are cultural differences, we somehow make it work. So did you all face, um, probably you all, you all were the early immigrants, or as, uh, as an immigrant yourself, how did you... How were you received as an interracial couple in the Houston community? Um, well, the community, the Iskon, the temple community here is mostly Indians. Okay. And then also the initial group of devotees who came were mostly from Gujarat, Gujaratis. So the interracial, there were several interracial couples actually in our community. Not just but most of them are like not arranged marriage, arranged as in, a, in the sense that you all were married, arranged? Well, my spiritual master arranged three marriages, actually four. And all four of us were in Houston. I see. And all the girls, all of us came from, from Fiji. And we were all married to Americans. So he, he arranged this. Um, and um, so 
the you may say there was a little bit of um, um, like discomfort mostly amongst the Indians. The, how do you deal with couples who are not of, from the same ethnic background? But they took it in their stride. How did you how, how did you adjust culturally? Of course, um, he would already be exposed to our uh, culture and stuff like that. It must have been is easy transit for you, or did you have to blend some things that that you brought back here? I think. Um, both of us maybe food or everything how, how did it go from there the, um, see very it's very central to our philosophy that we are basically souls and in that sense we are all connected Krishna is our father God is our father and therefore we are all related we may just have different coverings you know I have an Indian body and he has an American body but we are basically if we are serving God then we can be serving the supreme father that was so even though there were some differences, and even though there are some cultural things we have to consider, uh, just because we are brought up in a certain culture. So in the beginning, um, I think mostly the devotee, actually what, I, what we found is that the Indian people, when they saw Americans taking up their culture, they're very inspired. That inspired me in the beginning too, because I was thinking that, what is it that, you know, like um, Prabhupada said that, um, in India, everyone is looking to the West, right. you know. But when Western people take up Krishna, they take up our culture, our Hindu culture, or our Vedic culture, then the Indians look and see what is it about them. They've got everything. Right. Why are they taking up our culture? Then they realize the value of their own culture. So in that sense, the when the Indians saw that these Americans are taking up our tradition, it makes them think that you know what is so valuable about us that. These people who already have good, you know, like their values, and, 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 and why would they want something which is coming from India? But you, when you came to Houston, you were already uh, an immigrant to Fiji. Yes. And then you, this is the second uh, yes. stage of your immigration. Yes. Status. So, yes. what? She was born what, in Fiji. Yeah. You, you were yeah. born, I was born in Fiji. I was conceived in <laughs> India, but I was, was the first generation. So when your mother, mother came to Fiji, she was expecting you? Yes. Okay, that was in transition. Yes. So what was your experience as a, a growing up in Fiji as an immigrant, and how was it different when you came to Houston? I mean, this is definitely on a larger scale, so how did you? How did yes, you? well, I, I always considered myself as Indian when I was growing up in Fiji, and Fiji has a large population, almost, say, 40-50% of Indians. And I, I always thought I was Indian. I went to medical school in India. When I went to the medical, when I went to India, I realized that the Tangawala has more culture than I have, and we were the first generation born outside of India. The way they address you, the way they they behave with you, it's so respectful, and so culturally just ni nice. And then I realized that just in one generation we have lost so much. So I was really thankful that I got this experience of going to school in India, because I realized what. I had missed out on just just in that one generation, even though there are so many Indians. Now, when I made the transition here, the the difference between Fiji and here was that I had already started to study our philosophy, and I was convinced that this is the way of life I want to live. So I felt that I was coming here with something I, we all like um, in a richer way, right. more enriched. enriched, and therefore there was something that we could contribute. And you know, when you change. Um, your locations, there's going to be some discrimination. Right. But actually, I was quite surprised. I would go to the, you know, like I would wear a sari, and I, I would sometimes go to the library. And then I remember this one instance. There was this um, middle-aged lady. She came up to me. I was just wearing a regular sari. She said, "Oh, are you from India? Are you going? Are you a bride or going to a wedding?" Mm -hmm. okay. So you can see people really appreciate our culture. Right. We just have to have the confidence to carry it on. So what kind of questions were you, like when you went to public places, what were the typical questions that were asked of you when you wore the Indian attire? People like this dress. Okay. They really love it. And we actually, we, we showcase our culture. When we do, um, from the temple we do many events in Houston since it's so diverse. Mm -hmm. And we have a particular thing we present called Triya Sari. And it's amazing, so many people come, like local mainstream, they, they think it's so exotic. And then we show them how to put it on, and they feel so nice, you know? Like, they learn about our culture, and they see that we are also nice people. 
that it breaks that barrier that you know they are brown and I'm white, or they are brown and I'm black. Well, what, what you what you're saying is when you came to Houston, you were very comfortable wearing a sari anywhere. Yes. Okay. But right now, when we come to when we come as immigrants here, we the sooner we change to this culture and wear their clothes, it, and we feel more we are fitting in. Yes. We don't want people to look at us. But it is it was different then. Did you find many women wearing sarees? And well, I I have two lives. Apart from <laughs> Iskon people, did you yeah. find other women like you, Indian women who would walk into stores in Indian clothes? Well, um, like I said, I in my spiritual life, I this is how I dress. But of course, when I I'm working, I wear regular civilian clothes like the Americans wear because I feel that when patients are coming to you, they're already distressed, they're already sick, and they're not in full control of the faculty. So I don't want to make them more distressed by seeing someone in a strange dress. I so I chose not to wear this kind of dress just so that it's easier for them to blend in. And also it's easier for me to, so people, you know, you're looking in the job situation. So I chose to wear civilian clothing. Um, but in regular day-to-day -day activities, I find that when you wear a sari, people really, it's a conversation starter. So, Sarah uh, a you wear Indian clothes. Do you switch like her Sometimes. to Western, and, and what are the occasions that you would be switching clothes? Uh, like if I go to the Social Security office or I go to medical, I, sometimes I wear them I think I don't have an excuse that I don't have a nine-to-five job where I have to wear non-Indian or non-devotional clothing. But w when I do wear them, it's like it actually sometimes starts conversation. So wh where are you from? And I think people are also pretty good at just tuning out. There's a lot of variety in Houston. So, but it's mostly my perception. If I don't feel embarrassed then nobody else worries. And a lot of people like it, as my wife said. Uh, but just sometimes I don't want to, I just want to do some business and don't want to preach or, you know. And why exactly uh, do you wear only Indian clothes in the ISKCON? Is, is there a particular reason why you wear this style of clothing? Well, the basic idea is that we're not the body. And this type of clothing is very simple, like one piece of cloth of the dhoti, one kurta. It's easy to wash, it dries very quickly, especially in the summer. For the lifestyle that you all have, this is... We have the principle of simple living, high thinking. Think how many times people are changing their styles, their hairstyles, their clothing styles. It's a simple thing, and uh, just so we can focus on higher things as well. So I'm sure by all these years you would have visited India. Yeah. And what is the what is that you found when uh, with Indians that started coming here, um, and how how was your experience with them when you went back to India? Did you feel like you belonged to some part of India? How how was your experience? Well, you want to go to India? You mean? When she came, uh, like the way I'm asking, how mm -hmm. she felt when she came here. How did you feel when you go to India? Well, having learned something about the culture here certainly helps, and. Uh, I visited all the places that I read about in the scriptures. We have temples that, in many places like Vrindavan and Delhi and Mayapur and Bengal. And so I went to our temples where I was very much accepted. Traveled in trains and people were very friendly in India. You get very nice conversations. In the West, people are so much in a rush. Of course, they're in a rush in India in the big cities, but on trains, I met some very nice people and, and people like the fact, as she said, that somebody from the West is also interested in their culture. So together, and she's in a, in a professional job like she, we all know how doctors, how busy they are, and she still, she has some time, I mean, she dedicates time to the temple as well. How do you both, how do you, doctor, how do you balance your time? Uh, um, our, my, what I find is that uh, the foundational principle, if I make my spiritual foundation very strong, then I can do the rest of my duties very easily. So I concentrate on, um, we have a sadhana, a practice that we do every day, 
which involves chanting on Japa Mala and um, you know, reading the scripture, or studying the scripture, or hearing the scripture, and then attending a program in the morning. So when I do that well, um, then I find that my day goes very well. So I, that's my prime focus. And then part of my other sadhana is that uh, it's my dharma given to me by my spiritual teacher that I should continue to work as a physician. And uh, so that is how I also practice my dharma. And um, it allows me to come in touch with many different groups of people. And in those exchanges, there's an opportunity to speak about our culture when they see that we are from a different culture, to experience that. And uh, so, um, and of course, the, because the, our goal is that we want to satisfy the Lord, so whatever differences that there are, we, we make it work. Um, because when we have the same foundation, it's easy to work around the differences. Right. And, uh, you know, my husband doesn't require much uh, attention. He's basically self-sufficient. So he's not like the traditional, sometimes like the Indian person or husband who wants you to cook for him. <laughs> <laughs> so in that sense, I'm very lucky. <laughs> no, that's correct. So. Well, uh, if when you say you are interacting with groups, is this the groups of the mainstream uh, and how did you connect with them? And how did you, what were the challenges that you faced when you took your, um, you know, your philosophy and your practices, your lifestyle to the mainstream? And when did this happen, your connection from your, your comfort zone here, moving on to the mainstream challenges? Um, well, when you had said about like what challenges we met, I'll give you some examples. When I first came here in 1996, uh, we, we used to do these festivals, you know, like the um, mainstream events which happen here. Mm -hmm. And we try and participate in those, so that's a good audience for us to share our culture. So we used to have this festival called the Westheimer Art Festival, okay. and uh, which used to happen on Westheimer Street. And you this was uh, how in, early? In 1980s. Like in the 80s, okay. Yeah, and it, which that has evolved now into the Bio City Art Festival. Right. And we would bring, of course, our food, and our food is vegetarian. So when we would uh, like tell people, you know, like come try this vegetarian food, people would like turn their noses at us, like what rabbit food, yeah. you know, like I bring ah, some meat, you know. And now you fast forward. We were giving to, it free at first. Yeah, oh. we were giving it free, and now you fast forward, say, 15 years later. Right. Uh, we were invited to the Bio City Art Festival. It is one of the top 10 juried art shows in the whole nation, and the CEO at that time. Kim Stoinis, she saw that we, we have good vegetarian food. She, she told my husband, Sarva, we need you at our festival. And for about two years, we didn't enter. And then we, we brought our food, and they loved it. And that's a show, or that's an event, in which the food, they only chose seven food vendors in the beginning, and we were one of the seven. And of the seven, we were in the top three. Oh. So just tells you how... And what kind of food was that you were serving? It's vegetarian Indian food. It's, it's of course modified. Like dal, chawal? We did chawal, we did rice. Okay. And instead of, uh, we did like a, we did a Tex Indian style of food, like, you know, barbecue tofu, we would call it barbecue tandoori tofu. So instead of okay. meat, we had tofu. Uh, food fusion, some yeah. of the dishes were fusion. And then we would do samosas, people know samosas, they know lassi. Okay. Uh, so they even like, we even have like barfi, but we make it from peanut butter, not your traditional Indian barfi. So you and took our, uh, our dishes to the yeah. mainstream. Uh, I, I recall with that um, the city of Houston had, uh, you know, they have the international uh, festivals yes. and they feature, and they had featured India at one time. Yes. Were you involved? Uh, yes. And how did you integrate uh, the Indian culture there? What did you do to help? Oh, we were very, with the international festivals, we were involved with them for a few years prior to 2005. That's when they had the, the theme was India. Correct. And so prior Incredible. to that, we would have the food booth, and we would have literature booth, where we would present like the Bhagavad Gita, the different teachings from the Vedas, so people could come and look, like basically presenting Bhagavad Gita to people. And then in 2005, when it became India, then of course the um, Consulate General of India and the other Hindu organizations also participated in the planning meetings. Mm -hmm. And I remember that first day was a Saturday. We cooked as you, a little bit more, and... Um, we also had brought in the Festival of India. The Festival of India is a traveling festival mm -hmm. from ISKCON. It features okay. displays on reincarnation, Bhagavad Gita, 
karma, vegetarian. vegetarianism, uh, reincarnation, science in the Vedas. So, and they have this very beautiful displays, and the tents are very colorful, like Indian tents. Okay. So they gave us a spot actually, okay. at, at free of charge, because we are bringing in this, we are putting in the money to bring in these displays. So the whole lower St. Houston Park, we had that whole setup in that area, and it was beautiful. And what was it called? It was called Festival of India. No, the Festival of India, the, or that uh, yeah, pavilion was called it, Festival yeah, of India, yeah. I see, okay. And you know, the, the interesting thing was, for the I first time that. after many years, they had record crowds because the Indian population worked so hard to bring, and I first was amazed, we ran out of food by noon. The festival opens at 11, by like 12 or 2 we were done. We had to like, cook more. we had to cook more and like really scramble. And the restaurants next to us were doing, it was, IFS in the city were very happy. They said that, you know, like, they said like, yeah, the priests had said some prayers for good weather, and the um, attendance was going down. And then when they had India, the attendance just boomed. So that it was, was called Incredible India. I it was called Incredible India, So, yes. from your experience over the years, Doctor, that was in 2000, and you came as early as the 70s, right? You came in the 80s. In the 80s, mm -hmm. in the 80s. So in that 20 years, did you see something like that, or do you feel that Houston needs that kind of events to, you know, integrate communities like, uh, like the Indian community? Yeah, I think the work the Indian community has done, and what we have done has actually changed some of it, because like I said before, vegetarian was something to frown on. Now it's hip. Yes, it's it in. Is. If you're vegetarian, you're yes. vegan, you're cool. And the same way, like now, in, in Houston, they have this thing called the Vegan Fest or the Veg Fest. Right. Who would have heard of something like that in the middle of cowboy country, you know? Yes. Like where meat eating is so high and, you know, we produce And yoga. And yeah, meat. and yoga. And there's a Texas yoga conference we just hosted this year. So all these contributions, I think, the Indians have made to the community. And we add to the diversity of Houston. And actually, it's known that Houston is uh, one of the leading um, cities which show how diversity works in action. Okay. Isn't it? So, is there something that you distinctly remember together as something that um, that said that we are starting to connect with the mainstream? Is there a, an incident or a event that you all said? You all had ample Indian and American blend, like a festival or something that, uh, you know, Indian festival where like Holi or Diwali, something that had. Do you re recall anything that was, that gave you the feeling that we are now in, you know, learning correctly the way we should from the time that you came? Are we, do you remember any festival like that apart from the I think international festival? festival? Everybody comes there because they want to see. Yeah. But you see, like the we have about 200 Indo-American organizations in Houston, mm -hmm. and we do celebrations here and there. But do you think that we have done any such event that brought in so many of um, you know non-Indians to the culture? Are we making that effort to pray? Um, in your opinion, well, we recently had an event uh, at our temple called the Texas Yoga Conference which was mostly attended by local Americans. So it, and of course our... What would you say the percentage was? It was mostly, I think it was probably 95% or 99% Americans. Non-Americans. Non-Indians. Non-Indians. And then of course we did a Rath Yatra in two years, three years ago. And tell me about and Rath Yatra. What um, did you do for Rath Yatra? We, uh, we had partnered with another organization called Sky Foundation to do the Rath Yatra in, in the That is the Chariot Festival. Chariot Festival, okay. yes. I heard that. Yes. Which happens in Puri, you know? So right. Mm -hmm. uh, Prabhupada Chariot. brought this throughout the world. And because we don't have the, fe the chariots here, we partnered with another organization. And um, at that festival, we had um, reached to the local media. And at that festival, there were a lot of Americans who came, local people, and then of course the Indians came, and it was a very... About 50%. Uh, yeah, about 50% uh, Americans who came. So when, when you do events like that, Doctor, definitely there's a lot of um, financial, political, uh, my interest is how did you interact with the, any political pressures as such from the, city or, from the city or from outside? Did you have, did you impact anything like that, that they, they said you can't do this, you should do this? 
did did you get involved in any uh, okay so, issues that that you had to well traditionally we have done a lot of festivals in our temples and you know in Houston there are 20 or 21 Hindu temples and we always felt that we should take the temple to the people since people are not coming to us and we should contribute to the society or community we live in and not just take from them so uh, and of course because we did this event at an outside location Discovery Green has certain conditions that we have to meet. Okay. So we had, you know, certain legal conditions for the parade. You have to have so much petrol. Mm -hmm. You have to stay in your lanes. You have to get a permit for the parade. You, have, you know, so all those permitting we had, we had to do. But whenever we interacted mm -hmm. with the city or with Discovery Green, we found that they were very um, helpful and intrigued that mm -hmm. we were bringing this, we were adding to the, to, to the city. Like we were bringing something of value. Of value. Yes. So you, what you're saying is you didn't really face any uh, conflicts or any major challenges that you recall? No, I, I wouldn't say that we felt any major. I mean, sometimes during the course of our work, I remember when I was a resident, there was this one patient who was really suffering. And then, you know, in his, in his anger, he just told me, like, go back to your country. You know, when you, you know like, you some, that's mm -hmm. not uncommon when you see. But then I also had someone... When I was working in, in, in my student as, as an intern, we had this one lab technician who, who used to work at night, and everyone was scared of her. She was like really um, a difficult person. There was nothing you could do to, to make her happy. If we, did, if we took down the specimens for her, she was, ups she was upset that she had to do the work. And if we didn't bring it down, she said, we didn't get it in time, you know? Okay. And then so after then about six months of doing that, then one day she turned to me and she said, you know you're different. I said, oh, yeah. She said, you're not like those others. <laughs> okay. Then I, then I, then I understood. She in said, a good way. Yeah, in a good way. Okay. So th coming from her, that was like huge. Okay. She was never happy, you know. <laughs> but I can see that it's because we have this, this cultural upbringing, where we understand the the nature of a person. We 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 kind of work to make them comfortable, or like you know, meet them halfway so they can feel comfortable. So, and since you're on the on the topic of, you know, kind of understanding your patients and coming down how do you uh, how do you um, apply your philosophy or lifestyle in practice in in your medical practice what do you do that that makes them comfortable and makes them feel that you know you are a different person um, I, I don't know if it has this has to do with me being an Indian but I think it's part of our our culture is that we, we treat the whole person, no? we just don't treat right. a disease, we just don't treat a, a symptom. And the other thing is I spend time with them. I, I make sure that I establish rapport. And if when, we, when you establish rapport with the person, then only you can start to treat or, or make them feel better. So in general, they, um, they like it that I, have, I spend the time and I'm not so driven by, like, you know, I only have five minutes, I only have 15 minutes. Like, I try to take care of their needs. Um, so that I can serve them in the best way, because that's basically the service I do. If you were, to, if you were to be in India practicing medicine, mm. how would it be different for you, doctor? And you have visited India and you've seen all the yes. doctors. How would you be in India? How is it different here? I think here you have a lot more facility to do um, to help your patients. I was. We have a hospice in Vrindavan. Uh, where, you know, like devotees from all over the world will come to, like, leave their bodies. In the last days, they went to pass away in Vrindavan because it's considered very auspicious. So, you know, in that hospice, actually, they don't have narcotics. They don't have the strong pain medicines we have. And those, I visited them when I was there last year, and those patients are blissful. They don't have the pain medicines we have here, but they are still so, they are not suffering, as you would think they would suffer because of the pain. So even though they don't have the facility materially, but they have a spiritual strength um, which they, they um, depend on or call upon. And of course, so here I feel it's so much easier because the general you know, facilities and tests and all this are so easily available. Uh, but here we are a little bit lazy to make the national changes. Right. We, we want everything like real quick, you know, everything in a form of appeal so it comes. Of course that is changing. There is a demographic of patients who want alternative medicines, who want more like the natural or holistic type of care. And they are against allopathic. So we have a fair share of that also. And you, we can see that this shift is also happening. And this may be part of the contribution that we've made 
by introducing Ayurveda and more, you know, homeopathy, yeah, alternative type mm -hmm. of medicine or care system. So if you were to move back to India, you think you would comfortably be there or is it, how would you transit into that? It would be nice because I would, you know, we have this, that we should serve in the holy space, in the holy dham, okay. serve in Daman. So it would be very nice to do that service in the holy dham, directly in the Krishna's care. How would you feel, sir, how would, uh, moving to India and well, settling there? I think it would be less stressful in some ways because in America the medical system is very complicated. So much, she has probably as much paperwork to do as she does time with patients. I see. Okay. And it's so complex in America with all the insurance plans and the new government regulations. So I think she she's doing a pretty good job, but still it's hard for her to balance her personal needs with the professional needs in this current situation she's in now. Right. But Dr. Uh, Dr. Medley, uh, you have achieved a lot in your professional and in your spiritual and personal life. We all know you very well and uh, we are very honored that you both are here today. Uh, let me ask you what, how, what are your major achievements and what is your penultimate uh, goal that you have for you, set for yourself as a professional and uh, as a person? Mm, that's a big question. <laughs> so well, break it down to your, let's start with what are the major awards and major recognitions that you may have had over the years and what is it that you uh, regard the most closest that, you know, most privileged? Um, I feel that, um, you know, I trained as a physician, as that was my karma. And then my spiritual teacher, he helped me spiritualize that profession. So that even when I'm doing my duty, like I'm, I'm doing it for Krishna. He wanted me to do it as service to Krishna. So I remember that that's what I have to do. When I'm taking care of my patients or when I'm serving them, I, have to, I remember that I'm doing this as service for Krishna, so I have to do the best because he's the best. So, it, um, and also I'm the director of outreach for the Hare Krishna temple. And uh, my duty or my service is that I bring this culture to, um, Particularly, my focus is the non-Indian community, uh, because we have so many festivals which, which targets the Indian community. But I, I focus on, and my spiritual teacher wanted me to, wanted us to focus on integrating ourselves into the mainstream, so people become aware of what we have and what we have to offer. And you know, so um, and that to me gives a lot of satisfaction. So I try and collaborate with other organizations who have similar goals or similar um, uh, vision mm -hmm. to to bring our our core culture into the mainstream. So that to me is very fulfilling. So we work with, like we said, we work with IFEST, with the BioCity Art Festival, the July 4th celebrations, mm -hmm. then Interfaith Ministries. We do, um, we started with them, uh, well actually we used to do Food for Life, where we would bring vegetarian food or prasad to the homeless. In the beginning, we would have a truck. It's called Food for Life. Food for Life. Okay. Yeah, it's a global organization which okay. provides food. And, and when uh, was that started, Doctor? It has been started, I think, since ISKCON was started. One of uh, Prabhupada's um, uh, ideas or vision was that within 11 miles of a temple, no one should be hungry. So that's led to this uh, distribution of to this uh, Food for Life. So this organization, practically, most ISKCON temples will have a program like that. They will bring food to the needy. So now we are doing kids' meals. We do about 300 sack lunches for preschool children every week, which is distributed through kids' meals. Wow, so these are vegetarian sack And who, who's volunteers to do this? I mean, who funds this and who's... Uh, so right now it is an organization called FOR uh, and Be The Cause. So they partner with us to help make the sandwiches. And, and um, so, and then the temple and the four organizations, they help with the bringing in the, the money to, to do the sandwiches. So this is so one of your charitable um, efforts? Yes. In in the, the, which like is, outreach efforts. Yeah, is we understood, right? Okay. Is there and any educational and other... So the educational effort we have is basically through this, when we go out into the community with Bhagavad Gita and tell people about that. So, and then we do interfaith things with interfaith ministries or Rothbard Chapel. 
we also do, uh, also in terms of education just for the Indian community, one of the things we see is that people are afraid what will happen to the youth once they grow up here. So uh, we have a strong educational um, uh, initiative in the temple. We have Sunday school and we also have adult education where people can learn about Bhagavad Gita and Ramayana and Mahabharata and how to apply it to their lives. So we have a very vibrant Sunday school with 100 students right now. And uh, we also started, like we said, a Goswami Academy, a preschool right. for children. Right, I mentioned, yes. yes. So in, in all these programs, um, what is your major contribution? Basically to bring this to the, to the public at large and to make connections with other organizations. I, would go, I feel like it's, if we can collaborate instead of compete, then everyone wins. Okay. So that's one of our goals. That you know, like we have everyone, every organization has something of value. If we do it together, we can do better. Okay. So. So. That, that's, I think you you do, do go in that you do collaborate on certain levels, mm -hmm. right? To, uh, with festivals and all. Yes, I'm aware of that. So, did, is there any program that that you can say that I initiated this and it was successful or it was a failure. Is there any any program that that stands by you? Like it's your idea. And I think the outreach department was um, originally there, but I think we've developed it to the point where it's very consistent, and we have a lot of activities. For how many years when you um, were consistent? At least ten years. My spiritual master passed away in 2012. Yeah, so. Two, yeah, for 10 years it has been or at least four years, program. Yes. yes. And these are all the programs of the earth. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we when people went to about Hinduism, schools invite us, colleges invite us, you know, different like um, societies, they want to know about Indian culture. Or they, they want a speaker for a panel discussion, you know, or they want something, somebody to speak in healthcare about Hindu ethics. So we participate and provide speakers. Or and uh, you know and then also by giving them books to libraries, okay. by actually giving Bhagavad Gita and are you know, part of program. any school per curriculum? Uh, are you involved? Anything is? Did you did you actually partake in any policy decisions like to incorporate something of Indian culture in schools, uh, things like that? Were you on board where they were taking decisions to have like Indian studies or you know? Uh, of not personally. Like but when I first had India, Imperial India that year, they wrote a textbook for children, for, for high schools. And then we did provide people to, people in the community, in from our society who were teachers, to help with that curriculum. So it was called? Um, it, it, IFES would produce a book on the country it featured every year. So of, in India, that was part of what okay. we, we Is provided. it still available for reading? It should be. Okay. I would think so. That, uh, as far as, uh, you know, the Americans, when they think of ISKCON, is no offense, but they think they, they're they all over the place. They just spring up in public places and mm -hmm. they sing and they approach you and some mm -hmm. are sometimes taken positively, but sometimes they are not. So, in my opinion, was it a challenge and how did you handle that? How do you, the early immigrants, like, you know, they found them at the airports, they found mm -hmm. them at the public libraries, places, public places, they would just have their kirtans mm -hmm. and bhajans and did, was it challenging to be scorned at or be, you know, pushed away? How did you manage those challenges? It was challenging. You know, in the beginning when you start to, uh, the, the people who initially joined, we start, we're trying to uh, start a new organization, a new movement. So naturally, the the preaching spirit was more, was, it was more, so people were taking, were stronger, or taking stronger stances, you, I would say, or like more in your Rejecting your strong, strongly, uh, you mean? Okay. And, and so, you know, like we were not as polite maybe, and even maybe, you know, like really in your face. But as we matured, I think we straightened that out, and we became more cordial. Okay. And as, you know, as a society matures, then we, we learn how to integrate in the society better. Okay. So I think we have gone through that change in Islam. That, yeah. So yeah, we don't see that kind uh, anymore. But uh, that was that was one of your in major challenges. That, yes. Any when the sound of our movement came to America, he was almost seven, seventy years old, and in a like short, short time, he wrote so many books, and he wanted 
his message spread, and he mostly had young Americans, young people. So the time was short, and they were quite uh, enthusiastic mm -hmm. and immature sometimes. Yeah. But you have to be, get aggressively. Push it. But amazing yeah. amount of books were distributed, and now there's the words like karma and dharma are very common in the, in the reincarnation. Yeah, and also, accepted. so you do find more acceptance and more tolerance yeah. Uh, yeah. to people, and sure, okay. And you and see, sometimes people we'll, say, "Well, we don't see, they, they, we don't see you quite as much on the streets as we used to." Yes, and they're happy that we're still around. Yeah, and they you have, do yeah. hand out stuff, and they take yeah. it from you. Yeah, like they have no objection. Yeah. And to you see now, even like movies and television shows, they have they base some of these ideas from karma, or you know. You see, do you, do, do you have to do more explaining today than you had to do before about our culture and stuff like that. But it, I think it's the same. It's just maybe the, the dynamics have changed a little bit in terms of how we do it. But people are still now. People know more about it than they used to. When you say people, doctor, I would like to know how the the twenty unders are. You know, the young adults okay. are uh, taking you for you know. As okay. a, how do they approach you? Do they ask you a lot of questions about? Actually, I feel that uh, we have a vibrant youth community here. And in some ways, we just went yesterday to the Hindu Youth Awards, and um, where the Hindus of Greater Houston are trying to encourage our youth to take up Hindu culture. Okay. And then uh, the nice thing about our organization is that um, the people can actually, the young adults who come, they can see that it's a very practical application of the religion or the philosophy. They can continue with their careers, they can continue with their jobs, they can still live at home, and, but still add a spiritual dimension. And, and they're in some ways, they're very, they can integrate the religion or the spirituality into their lives in a very holistic way. So it's not such a dichotomous situation, it's like the straight jacket, like Hinduism, and you know, like, I'm a Hindu, I go to temple on Sunday or whatever, but then the rest when I'm at work or I'm in school, I, you know. We find that our youth are able to talk about our culture and our, with their friends. And even um, a comfortable being vegetarian or like the kind of food that they eat or not eating, you know, like their values, they're able to, mm -hmm. uh, to uphold them to the extent that they have taken formal vows at this age. Right. And, and uh, they're very happy doing it. So I know, I see that you're very focused on uh, disseminating or imparting our cultural values to the American community. What, may I ask, has, have you imbibed in, from the um, American culture in your lifestyle? Or what did you take from their culture uh, when you were growing up here? Or when, when you were I'll tell you a little, here. little story that our Srila Prabhupada would say. He would say that India is like the lame men, mm -hmm. you know, they have, uh, and the Americans are like the uh, blind men. Okay. If the lame man sits on the shoulders uh, of the um, blind person, then he, he can give him direction and both can progress. So like the Americans, they are uh, no. blind mm -hmm. spiritually. They don't know or they don't have as much understanding of philosophy like we do, or with uh, a tradition which is so deep. Deep. And so uh, vast, or vast. Mm -hmm. but, it, but the Indians may not have as much material advancement in terms of technology. So if the two of them cooperate, then both of them will make progress towards the goal. And you think we have? So I think by we, we do that. By you, you can take the the technology and the materialism of the West with the spiritual culture and the philosophy from the East, the spirituality, and you blend them together, and it's a win-win for both of us. I agree that very much with you, Doctor. If from your from your uh, age, um, people who are here, you probably are the second immigrant, mm -hmm. second uh, families that came. Mm -hmm. uh, so now the third generation immigrants are here. What would you, what would your message or advice to them be? You know how to cope with their lifestyle here. I would tell them they're the best of both worlds. They have the rich cultural heritage of India, and they have the material facility of the West. You could not be in a better place. And if you can just use or appreciate the value of each tradition, then you, it's, you, know, you cannot be more better place than having the best of both worlds. That's what I really feel. 
So do you? Can I add one thing that people yes. from India that don't have any connection to a temple or spiritual organization probably lose the lo too much of their culture too quickly. So we saw, we've seen that people that have some spiritual connection to their culture in America remain stronger and they're, they're generally successful materially, but they keep also a spiritual vitality. And they became become a good uh, example to the Americans Absolutely. on both levels. Yeah. And, and if thing, they don't, mm -hmm. if they become too Americanized, give up their own values, then that that is not a win-win. Yes, and on the same, you know, you. as a physician, I see Indians who, who I see nowadays, the young Indians who I may be seeing, like in the 20s and 40s, it's amazing. They're as much American as the Americans are. Right. And there is like, you know, because part of me asks, like, do you drink, do it, you smoke? It is the you know? adaptation we have, I think, very quickly we adapt to, but, yeah. and we are very quick to even give up something very quick. good yeah. as well. So you, you do encourage our younger generation to keep their to their roots and learn keep their language and stuff. Uh, and, uh, yeah, people who know multiple speak, languages are smarter, right? Yes, exactly. So you should learn your language. <laughs> They're scientifically disproven yeah. to be smarter. So what would your um, message be for today uh, to, you know, to conclude? Uh, what would you like to say and how would you like to be remembered in this country? Um, what would you say? <laughs> I would say that um, as Indians who have come into this country, we have the uh, very unique opportunity to bring our gifts to this country, our adopted country, and contribute something of value. And we can be remembered as, as people who came to give something and add value instead of people who came to take, like our lecture like Prabhupada said. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansamali. Thank you so much, Mr. Sarvabhavatasa. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, thank the Foundation for India Studies uh, to giving us this opportunity and also for the Oral History Project to give us this wonderful opportunity so I could share their experiences uh, in Houston. Thank you very much.